Apparently we are really big on being united today because we've got the United Earth Directorate versus the United Powers League. That's right, UED versus UPL. Though, I actually understand the UPL has actually been rebranded the APL. I don't know what it stands for, the Awesome Powers League maybe? I understand there was a concern that the UPL was being confused for the UED so they thought they'd change the first letter. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, these are fan-made custom races. And yes, they don't have that fine-tuned balance. But smart people have been hard at work on that. And as I think I said the last time we had this matchup, both these races are known for being OP, so it probably all works out in the wash. But the UED has undergone some fundamental changes since the last time I cast a game with it. All structures are now made by beacons, or the Beanie Babies as I call them. The cute dudes with the red hats. They only cost 50 minerals now, and you can make three at a time. If you got the charges ready. But gone are the days where you can just call down buildings wherever you want. We are playing on the map Dragon Scales, by the way. A two-player map with tons of high ground options. Salvager Both our players have sent a worker into their opponent's base to scout. Which means I've already gone and missed the intros entirely. Maybe that's for the best because our APL player is a barcode. And it's hard to read, but our yellow player, our UED player, is actually Tom Sawyer, a fan favorite around these parts. And so Tom is gonna see that his opponent did a fast expand. And even greedier, he does not seem to be making units. In contrast, the UED has made a strike trooper and it looks like he just missed out on getting the first blood on his opponent's scout. Yeah, Barcode has no way to stop Tom Sawyer from just scouting his base. He can camp there all day. He does have a billet up. That's his basic infantry production facility. So last time I cast the UPL, they pretty much built like an SCV. The worker would disappear, the structure would be constructed, and then the worker would reappear. You'd get it back. Now with the APL, it builds more like a Zerg. You lose the worker when you make a structure. And just like with the Zerg, that means the cost of all the structures are essentially reduced by 50 minerals to compensate. Okay, so Sawyer has skipped the usual Garms and he's massing up strike troopers. He's already got his tactics academy and he's working on his munitions factory. So he's running up his tech tree, he's got the bigger army, and he's ahead by eight workers. Barcode's now patrolling with a unit called the Heavy Gunner. Only costs 65 minerals, but gives you huge damage bonus versus armor. It's got the range of a Marauder too. But it looks like he could be going mech because he's made a second manufacturing facility. And he's already cranking out the ever popular TR-17s. These artillery weapons are functionally similar to a siege tank only they actually punch with even more damage, and they cost less, with an insane range of 14. Yes, that's even farther than a siege tank with Comstat, but they do not have splash, and when they're in mobile mode, they cannot attack. You'll notice Sawyer's making extra teleportation nodes. Big nerf to that structure. It now only summons one unit at a time. It used to act like a reactor barracks. Definitely got hit by that nerf bat. And as we saw, Sawyer has just added the Typhoon, a terrifying arc fire unit that has a quadruple attack. Oh, there you go, Barcode. That's how you do some good tank placement. You definitely want to siege those bad boys up right on the lip there. And that cool structure is a night jar. That is just a killer air ground turret, but it's not moving because Barcode has yet to load it with a trooper. That's right, most of the APL turrets, you actually have to put a pilot inside before it works. That's kind of a cool feature. In a way, it means all the turrets actually cost more than you think they do. You gotta put in the cheapest pilot you can find. That's probably the combat infantry unit. It costs 50. Oh, those typhoons are sexy. Oh, I think we're gonna get a demo here. Look at that, they just rain death. And that's actually gonna be a first blood, a delayed five minute first blood. I actually appreciate the passive game here. It's given me a chance to try to explain some of these units. Oh, perfect. One of those night jars is loaded, it's moving, the other one's still empty. You can see the difference. Night jars are not detectors though. They just do wicked damage against armor and they can hit air. Those other weird looking tower turrets are called electrostatic defense towers. Oh, forget that, we've got double airstrips with Ospreys in production. Barcode's gonna turn on the heat here. You can either use Ospreys to drop infantry or you can just attack with them like a Banshee. Sawyer does have missile turrets at some of his bases. Anyway, the electrostatic defense tower is a super cheap turret. You don't need to man it and it is a detector. The problem is it has a really weak attack, low damage, poor range. 
To me, really, its primary role in defense is as a valued speed bump. 250 hit points is nothing to sneeze at. It buys you time so you can react to an attack. But its attack, the 10 million volt energy discharge assembly, is not nearly as cool as it sounds. Okay, we've got Ospreys out. Okay, a couple of people have been commenting, or possibly complaining, I should say, that the UPL or APL, their units really look like Command and Conquer, or ordinary Earth units. The Osprey is a good example of that, and so is the TR-17. But that is actually intentional. The StarCraft II lore behind the United Powers League is that it's formed on Earth, and only a few hundred years in the future, too. So it's reasonable to think that the UPL would have lots of design features that we're familiar with. And Hugh, it looks like Barcode's gonna attempt some harass. It's gonna scout the fourth. The Osprey has two attacks. It's got a machine gun like a Marine, but it also has a projectile, which is much slower with heavier damage. The machine gun is hit scan, so you don't always see that it's damaging its target until it blows up anyway. Ospreys are super high utility. Air to air, air to ground, and it's a dropship. Oh, we can see the strike troopers have the upgrade spare rifle batteries. That gives them the range. Typhoons have range, but they cannot hit air targets. I could be wrong about this, but I think they used to. Oh, second Osprey linking up. There's some Maynarding salvagers here. They're getting picked off. I think spare rifle batteries is kind of like stim. It's an upgrade that's so good, it's just essential, and you see it in every game. And so Sawyer's gonna use his strike troopers to deal with the Osprey. And that will definitely work if the Ospreys stand pat instead of taking advantage of the fact that they can outmaneuver the ground units. I'll tell you the real reason why I'd be afraid to use Osprey when I'm playing against the UED. One of my biggest fears is the UED's Strike Fighter, the UED's basic air unit. It is so good, it has so much utility, I do not want to do anything to encourage my opponent to start making them. Fortunately for our barcoded player, it looks like Sawyer's answer is going to be to go for a bunch of turrets. You drop all those arsenals, which you need for supply anyway, and then you upgrade them into one of the four different UED turrets. Hopefully some of which will be missile turrets. Hold the phone! What Sawyer's actually making is five, yes, five Pina Mondays. The Pina Monday is the micro-only nuking unit. Not only do you not see them this early, you certainly don't see that many of them. It's like a support unit. It looks like Sawyer's using it like the core of his army. Maybe he's scouted all the TR-17s and he's like, you know what? I can outrange you. This is gonna be really weird. Our players are gonna be like blasting each other from halfway across the map. Sawyer increases the number of Pini Mondays in production up to six. He's already finished researching heavy weapon targeting adjustment level one. Booyah! One concern I would have is he's got to have vision for his Peony Mondays. Oh, they're rolling out already. And Barcode currently rules the skies. He keeps adding more Ospreys out of that double airstrip. I keep wanting to call them strip joints. That is not what the APL is all about. Oh, a single TR-17. That is a weird scouting unit. I think he's just going to waltz right in and start splatting stuff. None of the ground turrets have finished. Sawyer's so caught out of position and the TR-17 is going to do some worker damage. Oh, I do love how Sawyer doesn't overreact here. Rather than pull an entire control group over, he separates off a couple and deals with the threat that exists. That's actually a very mature response. I'd be like, send a hundred units, he's killing my workers, and then my entire army is out of position. You always want to act like your opponent is about to attack you in two places at once. Oh, looky looky, these T-17s are accompanied by Z-1s. Very gas intensive infantry. 75 minerals, 125 gas. They have a short range rifle that just does a ton of damage. Oh, Barcode's got the high ground. So your does have a spotter. He's got a crimson eye. That's that flying bug-like unit. That blue aftershock you're seeing is from a Peeny Monday cruise missile. It's almost like a mini storm. It does damage over time. The best part is it has a range of 20. But of course, the unit doesn't have a vision of 20, so you need a spotter, such as that crimson eye. And speaking of that Crimson Eye, Sawyer's researched authorized drone repair module. That means the Crimson Eye repairs mechanical units kind of like a medevac. Only now with the upgrade, he does it twice as fast. Okay, Sawyer gets position over an APL base. The TR-17s are waiting to punish him for it. He's got the Osprey to clear out the Crimson Eye. Oh yeah, here they come. Cruise missiles going down on the TR-17s. Barcode's gonna focus down that Crimson Eye. He gets it, but Sawyer might be in close enough that he just doesn't care anymore. He's trying to use his strike troopers to deal with the Osprey, and he cleans them up. Barcode's gonna try to retreat to the high ground. 
So where he's lost his ability to get vision up there. Oh, there's no troop in the night jar. His turret's just facing the wrong way, doing nothing. Not a good jar. Bad receptacle. Bad receptacle. You go back to holding pickles. Fortunately, Sawyer decides he doesn't want to push up that ramp without seeing what's up there. Typically, that's wise, but I think he just missed an opportunity there. Hard to really criticize that decision based on the information he had. He chooses to restock his crimson eyes. They fly out and the healing begins. Can I just say one more time, that is a crazy amount of Peeny Mondays. I've just never seen them used as the core of the army. Now they aren't cheaper than they used to be, and they're only four supply each instead of six. But this is definitely another creative strategy by Sawyer. And why not? He's got a huge supply lead, he's pulling in way more minerals, and he's got a gigantic bank. Barcode's trying to catch up by making eight TR-17s. Eight. Also, one car. We'll have to talk about the car later if we can. There's not any units in StarCraft with a more fun name than that. So Sawyer's got high ground vision now, and you can see he can really punish those TR-17s. They move so slow when they're sieged up, he can really land those cruise missile shots. A Zergling can dodge those pretty easy. The TR-17, not so much. But frankly, it's pretty cool that the TR-17 can move at all when it's sieged. Oh, but the Typhoon damage this is going to be too much. Oh, but it's Sawyer who's pulling back again. I don't think he realizes the advantage he has, or he realizes the range advantage he has from the high ground. I take it back, that's pretty smart. So Barco's having trouble getting vision with his Ospreys, and that could be where the car comes in. The car is this robotic unit that throws a flare and gives you vision in the distance. I think it's a really good synergy for the TR-17, but it's so expensive. Oh, and once again, the Ospreys are going to get a chance to take out those Crimson Eyes. Sawyer's lost all his strike troopers. He's trying to bring new ones into the field. Cruise missiles do not shoot up. As bad as I seem to think this has been going for Barcode, he really is closing the gap on supply here. And money. He's starting up a fifth, which will put him on even bases. Just a thought, if the APL is near future, and the UED is certainly far, far flung future. I think I'm starting to understand why people tell me this is a battle that could only happen in a time warp. These are not factions that exist in the same period of time. So I think Sawyer is really understanding that he can't just have an army of monoculture peeny Mondays. He's really restocking his strike troopers and there is the car. I'm not making this up, it's the C-A-R-R. -R. And oh perfect, he just threw down a flare. It's a cool graphic effect but it just means he has vision in that area. No energy required, just has a cooldown of nine seconds. And since it lasts 21 seconds, you can actually chain them. The car is not just a flare boy. He also has a grenade launcher. He's pretty tough and that's why he costs an insane 350 minerals and 150 gas. And that way he's almost like a tiny Thor. But the Thor, of course, does bonus damage to massive. The car's bonus damage is to armor. Okay, so Sawyer's rejuvenated his composition. He's got the Crimson Eyes, he's got the Strike Troopers back, but I don't think he has the Typhoons this time. Crimson Eyes is gonna scout, but the car is there. That's right, we brought a car. Oh, well, I'm having fun. The Ospreys are doing damage on the right-hand side. They've cleaned out all the missile turrets except for one. And I think I've commented before that the UED missile turrets do not have great range. Look at that, the Osprey like own two thirds of that base now. I really think Sawyer needs an air transition. This could be getting serious. It's asking a lot of strike troopers to anchor his entire anti-air defense. Even if they do have a spare rifle battery in their pocket. Okay, here we go. There is an air transition. It's actually going to be Valkyries. It's not strike fighters. And if your brain's going, wait a minute, air unit Valkyrie, isn't that a brood war thing? You're not wrong. That's another thing that is definitely intentional. The Terrans split off from the UED. They have units in common. Oh, look at that. Unoccupied night jars do not defend themselves very well. So he's trying to get revenge by attacking the bottom left once again. Barcode recalls his banshees to defend and finds there's too many strike troopers. Too many strike troopers, says the TR-17s. That's what we live for. Oh no, the car's going in the front. Not the car, not the car. He puts down flares and gets out of there. Now the TR-17s can blast away. Barcode no longer needs Osprey's revision. We've got a very cool rock, scissors, paper dynamic going on here. Osprey's going to work on the Peeny Monday. Strike Troopers going to work on the Ospreys. And the TR-17 definitely going to work on the Strike Troopers. And Peeny Monday's going to work on the TR-17. Dude, where's my car? Oh, there he is in the back. Get out of my dreams and into my car. Oh, the TR-17s can just not take the cruise missile hits. In its current incarnation, the missile only actually does 10 damage on impact. 
but then it ratchets up every second. If you don't move the affected unit, you eventually take 103 points of damage. Barco definitely sticking with the TR-17s and the Ospreys. He's making nothing else. It's not like the TR-17 and Ospreys aren't awesome. I just like another car. Oh, hello, the Valkyries have arrived. Hold it, that is not just Valkyries. Those are also transport and support shuttles. Oh, the Valkyries pull back. They're getting sucked into the electrostatic defense towers. Nobody told them the shot's like the actual damage equivalent of a Marine. Sawyer's destroyed the headquarters, and he's camped right outside the APL Natural. So that cool-looking skinny jet is called the Support Shuttle. Don't let the name fool you. It is a spellcaster with some of the UED's best spells. The name makes it sound like it's there to wave pom-poms. Force fields, cloak, and it blocks other casters. Both are players with big time banks here. Sawyer just researching every upgrade in the game. And why not? I don't think those TR-17 should be giving up the high ground. That base is gone, there's nothing to defend. The Crimson Eyes fly over to give vision and they're gonna get zapped by the electrostatic defense towers. So much for all my talking about how weak those things are. That was pretty important. Oh, renewed harass by the Osprey. But this time, the Valkyries are on the field. Are they actually fast enough to catch an Osprey? It would appear to be so. Particularly if the Osprey stopped moving. Yeah. Now, Sawyer also made some transport shuttles. We'll have to see what he means to do with those. They don't attack, but they've got massive cargo space. Oh, Barcode heard me. He's reclaiming the high ground. And he has a new car! He throws down a new flare for vision. And now the TR-17s are pounding away. It's like I always say, don't waste your time with a used car, get a new car! Actually, I think that's probably terrible financial advice. Fortunately, nobody ever gets their financial tips from YouTube videos. Right? Right? That's where the transport shuttles are for. Sawyer is going for a doom drop. He's looking at the main. There's only a single electrostatic defense tower there. Seriously, I don't think anybody cares. They are unloading strike troopers, lots of them. They are just gonna clear out that mineral line. And look at that, the escaping shuttles just fly over more towers. They don't even care. Barco's got five of them and they're not doing anything. The strike troopers are on top of the production, but there's a night jar right there and it's actually loaded with a pilot. The strike troopers take it down, but now the TR-17s are in place. Thanks for your help there, Osprey, but it's already been cleaned up. And the end result is that Barcode actually has a supply lead, 99% of which is all packed away in TR-17s. It's not actually the case that you're required to have 17 TR-17s, but that appears to be the secret strat that Barcode is unlocking. Sawyer rebuilding his missile turret defense back at his top right base. He wants to get that node macro going, there it goes. He's got a bit of a tech switch for us, he's adding the Citadel tanks. Is that an answer to 17 TR-17s? Because they are coming to his doorstep. Though actually some of those vehicles are A6s and roof tanks. So Barcode's also mixing up his composition. And don't forget the single car who fired off that flare. Hey, if you had a bunch of cars, would it be a carpool? And if you accidentally blew up your own car unit, would you say you had a car accident? Oh, here come the Peeny Mondays. They love death balls. Flare goes up to get that high ground vision. And the Peeny Mondays see the threat and they pull back. Everybody pulls back. And everybody changes their mind. Sawyer's actually mined out on two of his bases. So losing this is pretty significant. And he does. And Barcode's going to try to push right on through. Those Citadel tanks are cloaked courtesy of the support shuttle. There's no detection. It's a Klingon cloak though. They'll be revealed if they fire, which they do. Oh, the Citadel tanks use the magnetic wave acceleration. Okay, that was cool. He used four cloaked Citadels to go ballistic on that army. And then here comes the rest of his tanks to clean that up. Move over, Peeny Mundy. Here's some old fashioned armor. So Sawyer's recaptured his supply lead, but the difference this time is He's no longer the guy with the bank. It's Barcode who's the man with the bases right now. He's the player who really has the minerals flowing in. And it looks like he's droning up at a ton of his bases. Hey, I can actually get away with saying droning up because the APL's worker unit is actually called the mining drone. They really broke the mold with that one. Oh, we've got heavy armor versus heavy armor coming up yet again. They don't yet have vision of each other, but it's not surprising their bases are mighty close. Oh, but the UED force is headed north. Sawyer's got something else in mind. Well, one thing he's doing is he's rebuilding on the center left. 
But of note, barcode are APL players actually building in the top right hand corner. Oh, another near miss of forces. The Ospreys take some pot shots, but I don't know if Barcode actually saw them. If he did, he might want to have taken a few more freebies there. Oh, I see what's happening. Sawyer's swinging his forces around to the right. He wants to hit the APL in the east. And at the same time, he's trying a turret rush on that base in the top right. That is not easy to do because the UED turrets don't build that fast. What should be more easy is crushing this undefended base. There's the worker pull. That is a ton of armor. And the reaction is going to be the Ospreys are going to come back. They're going to be too late to save the headquarters, but they might be able to get a pound of flesh. It looks like Sawyer's just going to ignore the Ospreys. He's going to take the hits, and he's going to push out and see how much damage he can do. I mean, those Citadels are stacked. They got a lot of armor and a lot of HP. He's going to roll right into the triangular third. There's some defenses here. The Saltair turret's on man, but the Ninth Jars are loaded. Oh, it's magnetic wave acceleration again. The Citadel tanks just go nuclear. He's even going to put the cloaking drone on a few of them. Barcode's brought back his roof tanks, though. Heavy, heavy losses for both sides. But it looks like Barcode gets the better of it. He cleans that up. A big supply loss for Sawyer, and he no longer has the bank to just make it up. Oh, the turret war continues. Couple of night jars going back to try to defend against those arsenals. What? Ospreys? That's cheating. That's not a turret war. Sorry, he's going to cancel his investment. Oh, they forgot one, actually. I guess the Ospreys really want to reinforce the attack on the left-hand side here. The Ruth tanks are really proving to be too much for the UED to handle. Barcode is everywhere. He gets that last missile turret. What he's doing is he's taking down both of Sawyer's functioning mining bases. He's pretty much mined out everywhere else. The Valkyries are going to save the base, but only after the workers have all been killed. Oh, and as the Osprey retreat, they deal with that last lingering turret. And Sawyer's going to lose that left-hand side base for at least the third time. Oh, his mining has dropped to zero. That is huge. He's got three workers to his name. His army is half the size. Sawyer's economy is crippled. He's got to put all his units together in one big fist and try to go for some damage. The Osprey have been really effective tonight. The Valkyries are hunting for them in the wrong spot on the map. They can't do anything to those T-17s other than call them nasty names. Fortunately for Sawyer, that base is already mined out. It looked like Sawyer has put the last of his pennies into a round of Citadel tanks. He's going to need that to work. This is really weird how these units are just parked next to each other. Nope, Barcode's going to withdraw. Is he actually going to give Sawyer a chance to get back in this? Oh, that base has comm stations. Those sexy satellite dishes do more than just show movies. They actually boost production speed. Kind of like a detector that does Protoss Chrono Boost. There's the GG. So here's not going to do a final charge. A close game to the final minutes. Okay, so I don't have a victory screen for that. Congrats to Barcode. Great win. No doubt, his empty turrets were the key. He used them to fake out his opponent. Okay, so looking back on this one, my theory is Tom Sawyer was deliberately trying to win without resorting to strike fighter cheese. Because to my mind, strike fighters were absolutely what he needed in this game. Yes, Valkyries can counter the Ospreys. True enough. But when the Valkyries are not engaging the Osprey in a mech versus mech game, they're essentially dead supply. Strike fighters would have been a serious problem for the T-17s. The strike fighters would just rip them up from the sky, or they could have quickly circled around and ravaged the APL base, which had very little defense apart from electrostatic turrets. And given the tower's terrible range, the strike fighters could easily just go around them or pick them off one at a time. My other suggestion is much easier to say than do, but if a player is going to focus that heavily on Peely Mondays, he wants to be leaning on their single best feature, the insanely superior range of the cruise missile. Peeny Mondays can get beat up pretty easily, so the idea is to keep them as far away from everything as you can and just use spotters. Remember, there's a range upgrade for the Peely Mundy too, which makes them even more ridiculous. But what I want to show is what Sawyer did in this game, which was super cool. Check this out. Okay, so I'm going to cheat and I'm going to use fresh footage here because I wasn't quite satisfied with how I captured this in the cast. Okay, so Sawyer's left-hand base is getting attacked 
and he's got a near maxed army. So normally you just send out your gigantic army and you squash your opponent. But Sawyer is such a classic dude, he's gonna try to do something more impressive than that. He's gonna send over a handful of Peeny Mundies to try to keep him busy, but what he's really got planned involves the Citadel tank and the support shuttle. Ignore the Valkyries, they're just gonna get crushed. Here come the support shuttles. All four of them are gonna cast Activate Cloaking Drone on four different Citadel tanks. It lasts 120 seconds or until you fire. Sawyer knows his opponent has no detection, so he's really gonna make this count. I think he messes up and accidentally sends in the Valkyries and they just get cooked. Now a little freeze frame so I can explain what you're about to witness next. Now the Citadel tank costs 300 minerals, 200 gas, 6 supply, and it does 60 damage at a range of 7. Now that's pretty crazy by itself, but Sawyer has also researched Magnetic Wave Accelerator. This is going to bump up the range of the tank's attack from 7 to 10, but we don't really care because thanks to the cloak, we're already next door to everybody. But it's also going to increase the tank's attack speed by 3.5 times. Just to put that into perspective, Stimpak, one of the craziest upgrades in the game, gives you an increase in attack speed by just 50%. And it damages the Marine, and it's still pretty awesome. So what do we think this magnetic acceleration is gonna do? Well, from Barcode's perspective, it's gonna make his army vanish. Thank goodness he had the foresight to plant some TR-17s off on the left-hand side, because otherwise he would have lost everything. And then when Sawyer's done experimenting, he sends down the rest of his army and just cleans it all up. It's actually a real testament to Barcode that he actually came back from this. And that might just be because the mech units used by the APL are even better, but that's a story for another time. So much fun stuff in this game, lots of interesting units to unpack, but we'll probably need more games to really do that. So for now, let me just say from my base to yours, Zugs Wang out.